You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. Maximize your effectiveness in the changing global business environment with the postgraduate Oxford Diploma in Global Business. Taught in four short modules over a year, the program is designed to accelerate your career and increase your impact while minimizing the disruption to your work and family life. Learn alongside senior executives from around the world and develop a lifelong network. Visit the Zaid Business School website to find out more. Okay, uh, Johannes Oops. Becker. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time this morning to, to talk to me about issues with uh, taxation and uh, what we could feasibly do ab about this. And in order to get us get us started, I mean, the, uh, the issue of corporate taxation is, is regularly in the news. And uh, you as an expert in this field, what would you see as the, uh, the biggest current problems in this area of, of corporate taxation? So where are the biggest pressure points uh, from your point of view? Um, first of all, let me let me state that the uh, issue with corporate taxation is not so much an issue with uh, um, tax evasion. It's a it's an issue of uh, tax avoidance. That means legal means of um, reducing uh, the firm's uh, tax payments, tax liabilities. Um, and um, so uh, the current uh, system of international taxation is based uh, on the principle of source taxation. Um, and that that would mean that um, profits are taxed uh, where uh, profits are generated, and that is in itself um, a difficult concept because if um, we have a multinational firm where a product is produced in many locations, uh, then we need some um, concept, some principle that tells us which part of the profit is allocated to the different affiliates. And um, so in the modern economy, um, which is very much reliant on intangible assets, uh, this is very hard to do. And um, many multinational firms, especially the digital firms, um, manage to um, allocate a large part of the profit to entities in low tax jurisdictions. And that, well, that gives people the impression that they are tax dodgers. So. Um, and this is this is um, what they do is legal. This is uh, this is just say they um, they stick to the rules that are in place. Although some people say they rather bend them, um, and um, yeah, so so that that means that many many large very profitable firms uh, pay an effective tax rate on their worldwide income, which is far below ten percent, uh, sometimes even below five or three uh, percent. And uh, I mean, hasn't that always been, to some extent, the problem uh, between service, uh, the service economy and industry? I mean, if you are in an industrial company, it's it's fairly easy to say, you know, gear, the gearbox of that car was produced in location A and then shipped to location B, where it was actually put into the into the frame, right? So, but in in, in services, uh, it's always been a bit more difficult to identify where the value creation actually took place. Uh, hasn't that been historically the case? Uh, this is this is true, um, but the um, typical industrial um, um, uh, for manufacturing firms like car companies, um, um, companies like uh, Nike, for instance, that produce something tangible, uh, they are to an increasing degree uh, reliant on uh, brands on. Um, um, on intangibles that um, um, BMW, for instance, um, very much profits from their from their global brand, right? And um, so this is um, within their company, uh, very much reliant on on um, first management services, uh, then um, <clears throat> uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, the brand, as I just said. And so this is, um, you cannot draw this dividing line between the service sector and, and the manufacturing. 
Um, so th what I what I just said is equally true for for for, for the big and large manufacturing firm, at least in the in the in the consumer sector. Mm -hmm. So, but we we generally have to shift. I mean, not just towards a more digital economy, but towards a more intangible economy. And we had companies such as, say, Coca Cola is one of the examples that always yes. put forward that always relied on on brand to a large extent. All these big coffee chains, right? So. Um, right. and, and, you know, and pricing the value of the brand is, is obviously very, very difficult. I mean, if you go, say, to Starbucks and pay, I don't know, I don't drink any coffee, but say four euros for a cup. And in the bakery next door, it is uh, one euro. Is the brand value then literally the three euros? So, and, and, and basically you, you transfer uh, the kind of added value to the low tax jurisdiction by uh, licensing the brand from the location where the taxes uh, are lower. I mean, uh, that, that, was the, that has historically been the mechanism. So is this effect just becoming more pronounced because more and more the economy is reliant on intangible assets and especially uh, with the move towards the digital economy, uh, that is even more so true? Yeah, I think this is true. So we have this uh, big uh, structural change towards um, the, uh, the um, um, digital um, economy. Um, if you compare the most uh, profitable firms in um, in terms of stock value from, uh, say, the 2000s to now, uh, there, there has been big change. So the, um, the, the largest, the firms with the largest expected profitability are now um, uh, digital firms uh, like Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and so on. And these these firms are now becoming more and more profitable. And uh, so these are the firms that that engage in this kind of uh, uh, tax avoidance. And this is why we're talking about this now, because this is now scandalized. There is now the newspapers um, writing about it and people getting angry. Um, because they feel that these firms do not uh, contribute their fair uh, share to public goods. And, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, they are the ones that are in the news. But it's, it's a more widely spread problem because even tradi traditional companies are digitizing to, to different extents. But I mean, uh, even in, in what you would sort of term traditional industry sectors or tradi in the traditional economy, uh, digital technology will become an ever more important uh, part of it. So basically, the the problems that we have been seeing in, in relation to you know what is the identifiable tax base uh, that will become worse going forward and spread towards you know what we considered old the old economy companies uh, rather than remain isolated in the in the digital economy. Is that is that true? This is true, and um, uh, this is um, getting um, more and more a problem in these cases where more traditional uh, firms, um, which do not have this opportunity to uh, to lower their tax burden so much, are in direct competition uh, with um, firms uh, that uh, rely on more digital business models and uh, where their um, their their assets are more fluid or let's say intangible and are easily shifted across borders. Um, and you, you can you can think of the traditional newspapers are in competition with Facebook or Google, uh, but there there are lots of other um, other examples where where this is a problem and where the 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 tax aspect uh, increases the pressure on the more traditional um, sectors. Okay, so if the if the underlying problem is a an economy that is shifting towards immaterial assets and uh, towards the increased use of digital technology. And if that is even in the short term uh, causing disruption and unfair competition uh, in the tech space, so w what can be done? That's the easy question, isn't it? So how, how, can, we, how can we tackle this problem of the, of the very sort of soft tech space um, and at the same time create a, a more even playing field? Yeah, this is uh, this is the crucial question, and there's a uh, lot of debate going on. And uh, the good news is that um, policymakers all around the world have now understood there there needs to be done something. And uh, this is of course not a just an intellectual exercise to see a problem and uh, try to solve it, but there's a uh, lots of public pressure now. Uh, so this has been a um, um, uh, topic in the. Um, uh, in the Europe Parliament election campaigns, and um, so there, it, it, w it will be in in, um, in future political campaigns, and uh, this is why uh, why policymakers are now feel 
that they need to do something. And uh, so there's, um, I think there's a promising thing going on um, within the OECD um, inclusive framework. So there's now 129 countries uh, debating and uh, really um, thinking about um, uh, specific solutions to uh, some of the most urgent problems. The, these are mainly two um, fundamental problems. The first is um, that um, some of these countries manage to be active in a country without being liable to tax at all. And the reason is that the current system relies on a physical concept of presence. So this is called the permanent establishment. You need to have a building there. Ideally, so in the old world, that was a building where machines are, where there's something going on, a permanent establishment uh, with value creation in it. Um, if you run a platform, you can easily be active, a digital platform, you can easily be active in a country without having any physical presence. But then the, so to speak, the prerequisite of uh, corporate taxation is missing. And there's, uh, so there's a whole bunch of ideas how we can uh, change that. And uh, so we, um, we could think about a virtual um, permanent establishment, um, a digital presence somehow, and a lot of thinking is going into this direction. The other, and I think a little bit more important problem is of profit allocation. So once you have different affiliates in different countries, um, you need to allocate a given profit uh, to, to these um, locations. And um, so if, if you allow the firm to say all profit belongs to that one intangible asset, which happens to be in this low-tax jurisdiction, then you provide the firms with legal means to avoid in some time, uh, in, in, in some instances, um, uh, almost all taxes. Um, this will be different if, um, when you say, okay, the intangible asset needs to be where the other production factors are, like labor, tangible assets, and so on. So um, some, some of these ideas go into that direction. So you right? basically take, say, an idea of, of an algorithm and say, okay, if you use that algorithm in 100 countries, you have to split it up into 100 different pieces that are individually allocated to other sort of physical sort of location related aspects of your business this would this would be this would be the consequence yes so you you um, you split the the profit that would usually accrue to the algorithm and uh, allocate it to where the where the labor is that uses the algorithm um, uh, a whole uh, other approach is to say okay let's get rid of this source principle let's not let's not try to allocate profits where production is, let's let's um, shift it to the market jurisdiction where the consumers are, and this is this is a more fundamental approach um, because it, it 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 changes the rules that are in place now, right? So usually we think about value creation as something which is on the supply side, so the firm creates the value. Where is the firm? Well, where it's um, uh, production locations are um, and uh, and where its assets are and where its functions are and where the risk is managed. If we say, okay, um, the, the, the profit accrues to where they actually sell their stuff, this would be completely different. The, um, the, um, the main advantage of this approach is that uh, consumers are pretty immobile. Okay, so um, if I buy uh, an Apple computer, yeah, I won't change the the location of where I buy it uh, just because Apple could um, um, could save some money. Okay, um, so this is this is uh, the advantage. I'm not really sure whether this is as easy as some people today think it is, because the 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 location can be manipulated not in the way that I change the location, but that Apple. Uh, sells all its stuff to some other company. Yeah, let's say, well, just another company which which then resells it at a small margin. 
So this intermediary uh, company wouldn't make any profit at all. And the location of sales for Apple can be anywhere, right? In some low tech jurisdiction. So this, this whole system would break down or would require that the system looks through these uh, structures and say, okay, it's in fact, it's Apple which sells the computer. It's not that other company. So Apple would need to uh, uh, pay their taxes in Germany where I sit and buy the Apple computer. And that could be, could be imagined in the case of Apple, but it's very hard to imagine other cases where it's not that, that easy, where you don't have an Apple computer that is without doubt an Apple computer and not, not something else. Mm. And, and obviously, especially for small and medium-sized companies, that would complicate uh, operating business as well. I mean, uh, a few years ago, the EU reformed its VAT system. And uh, <laughs> as somebody who sell, I think at the time, two books online, um, where, the, where the principle, I mean, the idea, if I, if I remember correctly, was because... Amazon and others sold their ebooks uh, without any VAT out of Luxembourg, right, into the whole of the European Union. And then the principle changed, not the point of, of where, where the company was based, but where the consumer actually bought the book. But as a result, even, even the smallest of, uh, of vendors had to register in 28 uh, different countries um, for, for VAT. Um, there was this, you know, there was an incredible burden, especially for small and medium-sized companies. There was this so-called VAT moss, which was meant to make it a bit easier on a national level. But you would still have to retain... This, this mini one-stop shop. Exactly, yeah. But you would still have to retain two pieces of information for 10 years, uh, i.e. an IP location where the purchase was taken and a form of payment. So, um, I mean, uh, how, how can a, a small company actually save that uh, for 10 years and even in some cases... Uh, get the information in the first place. The, the net result was exactly uh, what you were referring to. Uh, the reseller market became uh, much more pronounced, uh, most of all, uh, by coincidence, Amazon. So you now upload your electronic books to uh, uh, Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. They sell it for you. You're not, a, you're not a seller. They are the seller. They deal with all the compliance issues that uh, you know, came about as a result of that um, principle change. Um, and uh, and you get a royalty rather than the actual the actual uh, sale value of, of of the book. So I mean, this sounds like we are caught between a rock and a hard place. I mean, either you make something incredibly difficult and intangible, tangible by trying to split it up and and allocate it to different locations, um, which is probably in accounting terms a nightmare to do, uh, also internally for uh, for companies. Or you change the whole principle uh, uh, around with the uh, well, as you say, with the with the uh, unwanted effects that you could have, sort of intermediaries now in between that basically uh, do not solve the, the actual underlying problem, uh, but just create an extra step. And if I may add to that, um, so in case of the VAT, this is not so much a problem for the uh, from the revenue side because the uh, rev uh, the VAT base is not affected. If um, um, the corporate tax is, uh, in principle, a tax on profit, and uh, so if you have these intermediary companies, the profit may may drop to zero. You just have this one intermediary, which just buys all the stuff and resells it and has a profit of zero, and this intermediary would be subject to tax in the country where the actual actual uh, where the good is sold to the to the consumer. So this would be an effective way of um, reducing the overall tax burden. In your example, it is just uh, of reducing the uh, burden of complexity, right? And but so the the tax in the end is the same. Hmm. Um, and uh, so this is this is from a um, complexity is a, is a big issue, and I think I have a feeling that it is on the radar on uh, of the. Um, uh, those in, 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 in charge, but as you said, it's very, very hard to solve. If you want to have something like a destination-based VA, VAT system uh, and you have these small vendors, um, this, is, this is something which, um, which is incredibly hard to solve, maybe in the future with better 
information technology, we will have some progress uh, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, you rightly say, because the, the VAT issue is, is a transaction uh, uh, tax, so the, the overall tax revenue remains the same, but it increases the complexity for somebody uh, to deal with it. Whereas in the, in the profit uh, tax case, I mean, it adds transaction costs, but ev eventually that's the same thing. It reduces the actual, the actual tax burden to, to zero because it just adds. Uh, and again, that would be um, probably a step that is only available to a, a certain type of big companies that, that yeah. you know, could actually afford to uh, run this complexity and add this transaction cost to have the, effective, the same effect in the end. So uh, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily even the playing field um, either. So, I mean, uh, which one of these two ways would you, would you think is the, uh, the most promising way forward? Or is, uh, you, you can probably, it's either or, you can't mix these things. Because uh, you know, also need, at the same time, should keep the tax uh, system transparent, manageable, fair, and all the rest of it. So, um, I mean, what, what would you say, what's the, the more promising way forward? Um. There's there's even another approach which is um, well it's not as principled as the other ones that are just outlined. Um, it's a very blunt instrument. It's the it's called the Globe um, proposal, um, 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 and uh, it's uh, an effective minimum tax. It's very blunt in the sense that um, uh, Germany would, for instance, get the right uh, to tax. Um, it's uh, the affiliates of its own firms um, abroad. Whenever their effective tax rate is below a certain level and would top up the tax effective tax rate up to a, a certain threshold, the, uh, the effective minimum tax. So that means if the Irish uh, affiliate of some German company only takes, uh, pays 3%, um, on their uh, on their uh, profit there, the German government would say, okay, uh, we get another seven, such that your effective tax rate is ten. This uh, global proposal um, would imply that this would even be for um, foreign firms that have affiliates here, and that shift profits out of out of uh, high tax countries. That means that this is um, uh, a tax on base eroding payments. Um, this is this is a very blunt instrument, and uh, the smaller uh, countries or the low tax countries are already complaining that this is this is a violation of their uh, uh, sovereignty rights, um, and they they actually have a point. But this is um, the good thing is that if if it works, it would be highly effective because there would be no point at all um, for tax havens to uh, to have a low tax rate because it would actually have no effect on the firm's tax payments. So um, if if the large players implement this, and I'm pretty optimistic that in the end we will have some, something like that, the, the, the US already has something, um, um, a similar instrument, the guilty, um, um, this would be the effective end of tax savings. Mm -hmm. At least for corporations, okay. Then tax havens have another function to shield the private income for um, for tax evading reasons. But um, yeah, for, for 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 corporate for corporations, this this would be this could well be the end uh, for uh, tax havens. And it's but it's just then an accounting nightmare because you would have to look at the effective tax rates being paid uh, by companies abroad all the time and then calculate it against your own measurements of, you know, the minimum tax, tax rate. Yeah, so there's all kinds of problems involved, as you can imagine. Um, so the, the, the one of the important problems is the one that you allude to is, um, well, what, what is the accounting standard um, which, uh, which is used to calculate the profit and the um, so the uh, the official answer is there would be some accounting standard that everybody agrees upon, and the honest answer is our standard. Right? Okay. So, right. so and, and this is this is part of this this uh, sovereignty issue that um, the Germany would say, okay, Ireland has calculated profit according to its own standards. Um, this is not our standard. According to our standards, the effective tax payments is much lower. 
And this is the, the standard that counts. And now we employ an additional tax. So, but, the, but that would in effect mean every Irish company that has some dealings with German company, we would have to recalculate their accounts according to different accounting standards to get to that base. Uh, in principle, yes. Yes. So there's, there's all kinds of simplification that could be done. Um, there's, it goes in a little bit in the same direction of what the EU tries to, uh, tries to achieve in terms of a common uh, corporate tax base. So there, there, is, there is already pressure in that direction. But in principle, you're right. Um, that uh, in terms of complexity, in terms of compliance costs, this 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 can be pretty uh, pretty uh, pretty severe. Yeah. But but interestingly, this gets us into the second uh, part of, of of the issue. So we talk now about the difficulties of of you know about the tax base and what what can or can't be done uh, uh, about this. So there's no easy solutions. That's that's probably the honest and straightforward answer. Uh, but there's also uh, tax arbitrage and tax competition uh, for the actual uh, level rates uh, amongst countries, uh, even within the European Union. Even though very few companies actually do pay the, the, the headline tax rate, right? there, is, there is evidence for a, a, a tax competition, which seems to be in a collective action problem that even within the European Union, uh, uh, we haven't been able uh, to deal with effectively. I mean, what is it called? A double Irish sandwich where, you know, holding company is Dutch and... Double something. Irish Dutch sandwich, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, something like this. So, um, I mean, wh how would you characterize this situation uh, uh, within the European Union, maybe globally, and what can be done to, to avoid that sort of, uh, yeah, tax competition amongst states? Yeah, so st starting with the with the globe proposal, um, uh, the, the the effective minimum tax, th this would be a very effective against these measures. So um, it, uh, the the effective minimum tax is, as the title says, an effective tax. So it it ignores completely the headline tax, right? It just says, okay, what is the actual tax payment divided uh, through profits? Okay, so um, this is um, um, so all uh, all this playing around with the tax base would be would not be effective against this instrument. The other the other reform proposals are well they they uh, they differ um, uh, with regard to that uh, problem. Uh, so shifting more taxing rights to the market jurisdiction is, as I said. In itself, uh, prone to new kinds of avoidance, but it would actually, if it works, it would get part of the profit that is shifted uh, between source locations right now would get part of the profits out of, out of the game and shifted to the market jurisdiction where the consumers are. And if it works, that that would, so to speak, reduce the incentive uh, to um, for the source locations to reduce their tax rates to engage in tax competition. So this, all these measures may in some, to some degree um, um, are able to alleviate this, uh, this, uh, this problem. Um, right now, there's, there's the strong incentive to uh, become um, uh, a location specialized in uh, intangibles. Right, and many countries do so. So the, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Ireland, um, so they all have specific um, uh, tax instruments, tax provisions that that uh, that target uh, this kind of um, companies uh, as holding companies for specific um, assets or for um, for certain structures that that enable firms to shift um, profit out of other high tax uh, jurisdictions. So, so basically, and within the European Union, decision making uh, and tax matters is unanimous, right? So you, you can't uh, sort of overrule individual countries. So you would really have to have some sort of common European approach where, you know, some countries get some other benefit if they give up their sort of low tax uh, strategy. Um, I mean, uh, I, I was in Ireland, or was it at the end of 2017? And they said, well, uh, in when Brexit is around the corner, it's probably the worst uh, point of time to ask us to give up basically our business model, right? So, uh, I mean, do you see any sort of way how this can be shaped into some sort of European-wide strategy? 
Uh, yeah, this is this is the um, one of the advantages to do this in the uh, under the roof of the OECD and not uh, so much under the roof of the of the EU. Um, you're right that um, I think all of these problems uh, are problems within the EU as well. Um, but they're of course larger than that, and um, if you don't get the US, China, India into um, into the into your boat, so to speak, that's that that would that would not make sense. And um, some of these proposals are again getting back to the effective minimum um, uh, tax are in principle uh, could be implemented in a unilateral way. Um, so the US did this. Um, in Europe, that would be more. Uh, complicated, but not due to the um, uh, unanimity principle, uh, but rather due to the um, European Court of Justice. Uh, um, what, what would the problem there be? Um, uh, the the problem would there it would violate one of the four freedoms. Right. So we have this. Um, uh, the ECJ usually is very strict, uh, and um, uh, if uh, if the German tax. Um, applies to some Irish affiliate, but not to some French affiliate. That would be a violation of the four freedoms of the um, case of discrimination. It seems so. This is the this is a, a legal question, and uh, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I, I work with people who think that they um, uh, that this is not a fundamental problem. So if you uh, this is a uh, just to just a question how you construct this tax. If it's in principle applies to every affiliate, even affiliates in Germany, but these affiliates usually pay a large enough tax so that they're not affected by the minimum tax, it should be in line with the, uh, with the four freedoms because it, it, it does not, it does not um, target a, a certain country or a certain nationality. It just targets low tax payments. Yeah, exactly. The principle is is applied to everybody, no matter where where, where, exactly. where, where you're yeah. from. So, and the the application of it then depends on your individual circumstances. But that is not that, that's not discrimination if the principle applies to across the board. It's still a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. It's just uh, if it's effectively a tax on Irish affiliates, then. I don't know. It seems that the that the legal standpoint is not that clear, but there's at least some opinions saying, uh, okay, you can do that. Um, if if it has, if there is an agreement from 129 countries of the OECD inclusive framework, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. So to convince the ECJ that this is this is actually fine. And is there also uh, maybe uh, an opportunity to go step by step? I mean, if I, if I understand you correctly, the, the idea of effective minimum taxation seems to be, at least in the short term, the, more, the most practical uh, uh, approach. Uh, but could that be the first stepping stone towards a, a system that is then uh, either, you know, uh, still the old principle or the new principle, uh, you know, shifting taxation to where consumption is? I mean, where would you see that develop uh, in a reasonable fashion? Or would you say uh, the effective uh, minimum taxation, that's basically what we can do and that's what it's got to be? Or yeah, um, I, think, I think in the end we will have a little bit of everything. Um, the, the reason is that there are different camps in these uh, in the group of uh, 129 countries. And uh, so the US is very much in favor of shifting more taxing rights to the market jurisdictions. Well, you may ask why may have to do with the fact that they have a huge trade deficit. Um, so Germany is not so much in favor, but you may ask why and may have to do. <laughs> so so Germany... Um, with the sizable uh, trade surplus, there you go. Yeah, um, so it's... Um, Ger Germany is maybe therefore uh, very much in favor of the, uh, of the minimum tax. Um, and it seems so people tell me that, um, so in the end we ha will have a little bit of everything in it. Whether this is the most efficient or more, most effective way, I don't know. Um, so if you ask for um, a sequencing, oh, this is, would ideally be done. Uh, I think there's, um, there's a, there may be the case for starting with the effective minimum tax, because then you, then you, um, 
destroy the um, the business model of the of the tax havens, and you get them into the camp that is may may have a, uh, uh, an interest in uh, shaping a tax system that makes a bit which is which is uh, more effective, which makes more which makes more sense. Um, and um, so it may so to be clear, that may actually lead to the tax havens having more revenue. Right. So because if if they if they know they can play around with their tax rate and the firm doesn't pay more tax because they would either pay it here or they're paid in the high tax country, they have an incentive to now really go up to that minimum level. And for some tax tax havens, um, think of Puerto Rico, um, they, they, they're not that rich. Some some tax havens are pretty rich, so they may not need the money. But they, for those uh, who cannot get any revenue out of uh, out of firms because they they're not attractive as a location just as a tax haven, that may be something which is uh, which may actually help them, mm. and they may switch to a business model that is more service oriented, uh, and even at that margin, it may be more efficient because the uh, they 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 cannot uh, advertise uh, their uh, low effective tax payments anymore. They have to do something else. They have to engage in I don't know. A good service industry, a good um, uh, uh, government services with regard to I don't know financial um, services that complement financial services. Uh, I don't know what can be done. No. Or they're moving more towards regulatory arbitrage rather than, than tax arbitrage. So they're, they're putting their focus more on uh, privacy issues uh, and, and, and these sort of things, information being locked down in the jurisdiction, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Tax havens, um, um, some tax havens have these uh, double function, being a tax haven for corporations and being a tax haven for private uh, individuals, uh, these uh, famous uh, high net worth uh, um, in, uh, uh, individuals that uh, um, hide their money in these jurisdictions. Mm. And, and, um, and I think what um, hopefully gets clear also for the, the viewers and, and, and the listeners is that, you know, there are some really uh, tricky underlying issues under all these, uh, these tax reform ideas. So it is not the, the case, as, as is often assumed, that you know, politicians just don't want to tax these companies or are in bed with companies. Uh, but there are some really difficult principle underlying problems that, that need to be solved for the long run. Also, there is no quick fix in the sense that, you know, a tax system should be, the principles of a tax system should be permanent because it's, it's important, you know, for businesses to be able to, to deal with a tax structure and you can't change it, uh, especially not the underlying principle every, every two years or so. So um, I, I think that that is an important, important point to make uh, that, you know, it is a, is a very tricky area of policy reform and, and not just a case where companies bought politics. This is certainly true. So there, there's no outright corruption in any in um, in any sense. But uh, having said this, it should be well. You may find that peculiar that um, um, so all of a sudden we can imagine of things being done, and for years or decades it was just that. Uh, so we cannot done, do do anything about that. It's just the uh, the rules, and we cannot affect the rules because we're a small country, and so on and so on. Um, I think the the public pressure is a decisive um, aspect in all this. Uh, that that uh, politicians feel that they need to respond, otherwise they 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 get the, they get punished at the um, at the ballots. Um, um, and um, so it it seems that all la all of these large high large high tax countries have their own tax havens, right? So the U.S. has Bermudas and even Puerto Rico. Um, the U.K. has um, uh, Jersey, Isle of Man. I don't know all, all, all these. Um, um, Germany has Luxembourg, right? Right next to it, where um, um, German firms can use structures to lower their uh, tax payments in Germany and abroad, right? So this is tax havens are used as a means of strategic trade policy. You can't tell me that the U.S. is completely helpless 
when it comes to Bermuda or, or Puerto Rico. That's that's that doesn't make any sense, right? So they they can if they want to, they can sh shut them down almost immediately. They they won't and they don't. Why? Because they know that their companies are in competition with other companies that use their own tax havens. So the, the, there is this strategic trade thing going on, and um, th this is why we need uh, coordination. And so now there's this public pressure that forces people to say, okay, well, it doesn't make sense to move first, so to sh shut down all of our tax havens, and German companies are now at a, at a strategic disadvantage in third markets. Um, but it may make sense to have a global agreement that we that we uh, change the tax system such that this implicit subsidy is reduced. Because we know from a global point of view, reducing subsidies in these instances is uh, efficient. Yeah. And uh, we, we might have just uh, straightforwardly reached a tipping point, because uh, if you look at the uh, tax revenues, um, uh, more and more the immobile subject have, have taken over a, a larger a larger share of, of the burden and at, at some point you know that, that underlying feeling of being unfairly treated uh, when others get away others that would be much more able to afford to pay their fair share um, you know that that led to uh, to to that kind of uh, public pressure that we're seeing now I mean we, we, we've seen research uh, showing the extent uh, uh, of this and that's, that's gotten much worse in recent years again Right. So um, rather than saying, I mean, from my point of view, of course, there's always been corporate lobbying and that will always, always be the case. Um, but, you know, the perception often is that there is sort of outright sort of being in bed with companies. Uh, and I don't get the impression that this, is, that this is necessarily the case beyond the normal lobbying. What, what is now different, I think, is that, you know, previously, because of all these difficulties in reforming the system, uh, People probably thought, well, there's not much to be won if you, if you, if you, you, know, you know, just take this hot potato. Uh, but now they have to because the public pressure, rightly so, uh, because you need, basically societies need this kind of tax revenue to finance public life, right, and, and, and public goods. Um, you know, that reached a tipping point where now uh, there is, it is no longer an option to uh, basically avoid the issue uh, in, in, in its totality. And, and now... Uh, there is a there's a, a pressure behind it. I mean, remember back you, you mentioned the European Parliament elections. I mean, five years ago, uh, the financial transaction tax uh, was one of the one of the key uh, uh, campaign elements, and, and and nothing has happened since. So uh, may, maybe that is the um, the difference between sort of five years ago and now. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, um, the only thing that I wanted to add is. Um, so it's not about the revenue that we need, right? It's the, um, if you look at the, um, the um, spending uh, per GDP in almost all countries hasn't gone down since the 1980s, since the start of tax competition as we know it. It's what actually happens is that, as you said, we shift the tax burden from the mobile factors to the immobile ones. And we now, we now have the evidence um, so there's this recent AR paper by Peter Egan co-authors um, that actually shows that, uh, that globalization has led to more inequality. And uh, we have other papers showing that uh, corporate tax cuts increase inequality. And this is, this is, what, um, this is what happens um, uh, when, we, when we try to, um, try to engage in tax competition so the collateral damage is our own um, distribution of income and wealth. And we are, I don't know whether this, I, I hope it's not a tipping point already, but it's, uh, it's something which is, uh, which is now on the radar. And uh, I think rightly so. And I think we, we need to tackle this because otherwise um, much more is happening than just, uh, just a little bit of outrage about these tax dodgers. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you say, the the uh, public spending as a percentage of GDP remained roughly the same, but you know, the the burden of of raising this money uh, was shifted towards the the ones who could least afford it, or yes. uh, certainly afforded less than the ones that paid uh, a, a lesser lesser share. 
uh, of it. Yeah. So, and then obviously this has to be has to be reversed, and uh, especially in view of uh, some public policy issues that probably require some long term investment going forward. But let, let me come to the to the to the final question. Then, um, you know, if uh, we, we talked a lot about the the difficult uh, set of problems, but if you were a policymaker and were tasked with you know, what three steps do we need to take now? Uh, step one, two, three, uh, to try to, uh, you know, get a grip on the problem. How, how, where would you start? What would be your top three priorities? In terms, you mean, in terms of corporate taxation? Or... Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, the, I, I think the, uh, the, the first uh, thing uh, would be um, to implement uh, an effective minimum tax, ideally, in coalition with the um, main global players, uh, which, as I said, would be effective tool against uh, tax competition. Uh, second uh, one, um, uh, yeah, I would. There's there's these proposals that try to link um, uh, intangibles more to the uh, tangibles or to uh, to to labor. Uh, I would try to push for that a little bit more. Um, and um, uh, and the and the uh, third one would be to um, push for harmonization of our, our corporate uh, tax bases, which is uh, which would ideally start within the EU. Um, and uh, so with these three steps, um, uh, I think a lot could be done without any explicit harmonization of rates, uh, without taking away from peripheral countries like Portugal, Ireland, and so on, their means of uh, becoming or um, remaining an attractive uh, location for investment. Um, and uh, all these three steps would effectively mitigate tax competition. And I think it's it's a realistic way. So I could go further and say for unitary taxation of the whole world and uh, implement the global uh, treasury uh, but all this is not this is not going to happen well that's also i think beyond the first three steps <laughs> well Johannes becker thank you very much uh, indeed for taking the time this morning and uh, well we'll see i mean uh, maybe uh, at least harmonizing the tax base might be something the new european commission uh, might want to want to get its teeth into uh, thank you very much indeed uh, thank you thank you very much for listening we hope you enjoyed it Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time.